thanks Amy um, for curating these talks every month. Uh, it's been a super cool little group that has formed and I've learned a lot so far. Um, and thank you all for being here today. Um, as she mentioned, uh, my name is Kelsey Zittars. I'm a graphic designer, illustrator, um, fine artist, and also a river guide. And also, as she mentioned, one of these things is not quite like the other, which I'll get into. Um, so I, my work today, I do everything from logo design and brand identity, um, illustrations like infographics, ski graphics, pretty much anything in the 2D visual realm. Um, and then I also paint and exhibit my fine artwork. Um, and so what I'm hoping with this talk is that a little bit of what I've learned over the last four years of being a freelance independent um, artist uh, can apply to your own practices. Um, this talk is called Accessing Creativity from the Road, or on the Road, um, and I added this little subtext in On the River and in your parents' basement, and from the living room, and from blank. Because um, it's really about uh, accessing creativity, but also being productive and keeping up with a consistent practice, no matter what your circumstances or environment. Uh, is anybody in here familiar with the book, The War of Art? Uh, it's been one of my personal Bibles over the last however many years. Um, I kept on recommending it to my sister, who's an actress, and she finally one day was like, Kelsey, I don't understand why you're trying to push this book on Chinese war tactics on me. Um, but of course, that's the art of war. Uh, <laughs> the, the War of Art is very different. It's a pretty small book. They're kind of one-page chapters, and he talks a lot about resistance in our creative practices. And this is uh, something that I've struggled with as long as I can remember, is why do we encounter so much resistance for even for those things that we are most passionate about? Um, I, painting has been my passion for as long as I can remember. I talk about it, I think about it all the time, and then when I finally get to that time frame that I set up to do the work, I find myself cleaning the refrigerator half an hour later. Um, does anybody experience kind of these same things? Uh, yeah, so what I've come to realize is that this is never going to go away. Uh, so we need to develop habits and environments that will help us um, uh, be successful in the face of resistance. Um, and this is the best succinct answer I found in that book as to why that happens is that a more, the more important a call or action is to our soul's evolution, the more resistance we will feel towards pursuing it. And not to get like too woo-woo or religious, whatever you believe, um, as we become what we are supposed to be in this world, um, there's always going to be that opposing force making sure that we really, really want to do that. So um, I'm going to take it back a little bit and tell you my background and how I got to where I am today and some of the things I use to uh, battle resistance. So, I was always a pretty creative kid and very fashionable, as you can see, <laughs> in my uh, homemade jungle print jumpsuit with my white tall tee in this picture. Um, my earliest memories of being creative uh, is about three or four years old, and I remember drawing to the radio and changing my brush strokes with, well, I think I was using a marker, um, to the cadence of the music. I want to thank it was the late 80s, so I want to think it was something along the lines of like the Pixies or Depeche Mode, but my mom was very into uh, Magic 93.9, so I think it was more along the lines of like Michael Bolton or something. <laughs> um, uh, I was around in, like the third grade. I often stayed inside at recess and would draw cartoon characters for my friends. And being a pretty shy kid, uh, it was pretty neat for me to gain attention for something that I didn't have to talk much. Fast forward to today, and I'm standing here in front of you. So, uh, my plan backfired. Um, around like high school age, here's a picture from my diary when I was 18 or 19 years old. I uh, was obviously very concerned about being pushed into the conformity fabric of society, um, and I can, you know, continued painting and playing around with Photoshop and whatnot throughout my high school years. So, I ended up going into the graphic design program at MSU. Um, which is, for many fine artists, uh, graphic design becomes 
a really attractive option to actually maybe make a living as an artist and not solely rely on your fine art. Um, but then I graduated in 2009, so a really fun time. I had a delivery session. Um, the year after I graduated, I probably applied for over 60 jobs in my field to no avail. Finally landed a job a year later as a graphic designer at the Outlaw Partners, um, which is a media and marketing firm based in Big Sky, uh, where I worked full time for five years. So little side note here for anybody just starting out in their field um, or just coming out of school, I highly recommend working in, if you can, working in a collaborative studio environment. Um, as opposed to going out on your own right away. Um, this was just the best education I could have received as I was working for, it was a really fast paced uh, environment. I was working for clients in all different industries, big and small. Um, so it was just, it was a great kind of start to my career and learning all these things. Um, however, it was about year four, working full time there, that I started to experience some burnout. Um, I felt pretty creatively tapped at the end of the day. I would come home at night and feel like I didn't have uh, the energy or motivation or inspiration to be working on my painting as much as I wanted to. Um, and also felt like since most of my work was very project based, I didn't necessarily need to be sitting at a desk every day, all day. Um, at about, about the same time, Instagram was on the rise and I began to see all these hashtag van life people um, making working from the road look really attractive. Um, and I thought, why couldn't I do that? So I started to put a plan in action. And in the fall of 2015, uh, my partner and I at the time uh, bought a camper, quit our jobs, packed up our things into a storage unit, and uh, hit the road for what was going to be indefinitely. So the picture on the right here is um, from our camper coffee table to give you an idea of where we traveled those first few months. Um, we first went to southeastern Arizona, down in here, um, as I had an artist residency at Shirakawa National Monument for the first two weeks where we were put up in a forest service cabin there. Um, so the picture on the left is from my time there. This is our rusted out F-250 with our camper we found on Craigslist uh, parked in front of the organ pipe uh, formation in Chiricahua. So, but I quickly learned that uh, everything that I was seeing on social media wasn't what, what it wasn't what it was cracked up to me. Um, so yeah, on the left we have a very like, well maybe not typical, but picture you might see um, yeah, living on the road. This is my like would-be boyfriend, and we're parked at the ocean somewhere because there's tons of like free BLM land on the California coast, right? <laughs> um, we're eating crumpets, and this is like the world map of all the places we're gonna go to because we have some sort of chitty bang bang type vehicle that we can fly all over the world. <laughs> um, the picture on the right was from our first few days on the road. We just gotten to the north rim of the Grand Canyon and I was hugging Wi-Fi at this gas station for I don't know how long trying to get any bar of service to get a project into a client that day. Because you can see I'm super thrilled about it. <laughs> um, which was a lot of what it was like working on the road. Um, here's a view of my little office set up inside the camper. I largely re relied on this uh, Verizon jetpack device that uh, basically takes any uh, cell data that you can find and transforms it into Wi-Fi that you can work off of. Fortunately, it leads to a really high phone bill. Um, on the right here, I was working on the Happy Dog Beer Co. labels at the time, if you've seen those around town. Um, so there were a lot of ups and downs to working on the road. I um, developed a practice where I could really, or I learned how to work anywhere, um, setting up my canvas whenever we had a little bit of time and the freedom was unreal. However, um, I felt like a lot of our energy each day was put into where we were gonna park, what we were gonna eat, um, chasing Wi-Fi and cell data so I could keep working. And then there were a lot of financial pressures trying to keep up all these projects uh, while traveling. Uh, so it wasn't a few months in that my partner and I ended up splitting due to a lot of those pressures. Um, I ended up moving back home with my parents for a little while to regroup. 
but I wasn't quite ready to give up the, the vagabond lifestyle. <laughs> Um, in June of that year, I was invited on the Middle Fork of the Salmon River for the first time. And this was absolutely a lightning strike turning point moment for me. Um, I had done, uh, developed a logo for a new company on the Middle Fork, and so they invited me on a trip to do some artwork in exchange, or that they could put on hats and t-shirts and uh, posters and whatnot uh, in exchange for the trip. So I became completely enamored with the river and the lifestyle and everything about it at this point. Um, but the following month, I went on the Grand Canyon for the first time, which solidified this love even more. And by August of that summer, I was back on the Middle Fork training to be a guide. I wanted to do anything to make it possible to be out in this environment as much as I could. Um, so the following year, I. Uh, did everything I could to develop those skills to guide the following season. I got back on the Grand Canyon in January and rode all 280 miles with my own boat. I went to guide school in California, swift water training, and uh, woofer, uh, got my woofer cert certification. Um, however, so I, I don't feel like I've been all in on something ever before in my life as much as I was in that point. I also was had never been so scared. But what I learned from the war part and other resources that um, fear is the biggest indicator that you should do something more than ever, which is why I'm doing this talk. <laughs> <laughs> so but it's, I was scared of you know certain things like on the river, such as flipping or wrapping my boat, but I was also scared of uh, losing my creative practice and losing my clients because I was going to be working in the wilderness for three to four months out of the summer. For those of you that don't know, the Middle Fork is about a 100 mile stretch of river. Um, trips usually run five to six days. And as a guide, you're working from 5.30 in the morning to nine at night. And you might only get 12 hours off between trips, enough to get home, um, do laundry, de-rig, and you're back on the river the next day. So there was no way I was gonna keep up my client work during the summer. Um, so I was afraid of losing momentum. However, um, now I've completed my third year as a guide on the Middle Fork, and it's actually influenced my work in really interesting ways, and both in like my commercial and personal work. Um, I actually learned a lot about the Middle Fork um, and could identify landmarks and river flows um, from sketches that I had done. And it began to um, lead into client work as well. This is a map that I created for our company last year. Um, and we now give this map as a gift to clients on the river. Uh, this is a commission I got from Boar's Whitewater. I did a few hat designs for them um, and a map for their catalog. So this really interesting niche formed between being an artist and a guide, which I never had expected. And then in my personal work, I began to take um, little things that I do in my sketchbook and make bigger pieces and then show them or paint during the winter and um, show them in shows. Here's just a quick little uh, process video on the paintings that I made. This time I was working off of photographs uh, from a hike I had taken. So this was, I'd hiked up to this hill looking downriver and 
This was our campsite uh, right in here. This is like the edding where we parked our boats right in her chin there. So this is still one of my favorite paintings I've got today. So how important is environment? Up until this point, I've been talking about um, being able to work from anywhere in any circumstances, um, given any amount of time. Um, some productivity experts would argue that environment is everything. Everything you see, hear, smell, taste, and touch is an environment. And those environments are either adding energy or draining energy. Um, I'm going to play a quick video from Jim Bonch, who, um, this was an interview on the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, which has uh, been one of my favorites for years. Um, I'm just going to play a couple of minutes to have him talk to you about environments. So he goes on to talk about um, your different types of environments and um, how you can kind of set yourself up for success um, based on how you set those up. So you're not relying solely on willpower to do the work that you want to do. Um, you have this, this environment set up that um, works for you and in your uh, daily habits. So I've experimented a lot when I'm not on the river, not on the road, with uh, different types of environments where I can do my creative work. Uh, this is my living room in Big Sky, my parents' basement, my garage, another living room, a really gross basement in Bozeman, my bedroom, um, and an outside studio space that, or not outside, um, like a collaborative studio space that I rented uh, a couple years ago in Bozeman. And this is my space today. Well, it was a year ago when I moved in. It's a little messier now. Um, but what I've discovered is, for me, I really need it to be right there in front of me every day. Having to drive to a studio space outside of my house, I felt that, you know, especially in the wintertime when it gets dark, I never wanted to go out there. For other people, they have to leave the house, um, or else there's too many distractions around um, to dissuade them from their work. So it's really about developing all that works for you. Um, and now when I'm home, I have a very, I create a pretty strict schedule for myself, ideally. Um, I map out my day the night before, so hour to hour of what projects I'm gonna work on. I try to wake up the same time every day. I eat almost the same things every day. So all those uh, things that were taking my mental energy while I was working on the road, those are taken care of. Now I can just solely uh, put my brain energy towards whatever I'm working on that day. Um, my painting practice, I try to work at, I try to work every day, at least for 20 minutes. Um, usually it's between two to four hours. Um, and it's really about that consistent habit. Is it the best work every day? No, but it's about sitting down and doing the work every day. So overall, um, it's about developing this daily practice environment that works for you. There's been so many studies done on this with our, of artistic geniuses of the past, of what time they got up, what time, or what did they eat that day? Did they use a word processor or a typewriter? How did they get to this creative genius that they got to? Um, and the real answer is none of that really matters. Um, what matters is doing the work every day. Um, in addition, you need that anytime, anywhere practice for gathering inspiration. As we've talked in this group before, um, our best ideas don't usually come when we're sitting at our desk working, right? We talked about it comes in the shower, or when we're driving, or having a glass of wine, or exercising. Um, so we need to be set up to capture that when those ideas strike us. Um, Again, whatever works for you. It can be an app on your phone. I usually have a small sketchbook with me, a journal. Um, you could use a voice recorder, all like Kevin McAllister in Home Alone. Um, really, like whatever tools work for you. Um, and this is also about taking back those times when we are scrolling through our phones to put that down and really sit back and observe. I can't tell you how many little sketches I have of either the coffee that I'm drinking or the wine that I'm drinking while waiting, waiting in an airport. And you really begin to notice the little nuances of life just by taking a few minutes um, to do this. And then finally, we need to leave room for serendipity mode. Serendipity mode is a concept that I came across while listening to um, a Joe Rogan podcast recently. He was doing an interview with uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, the astrophysicist, 
and they were talking about this proposed telescope, um, uh, it's going to be a 30 meter telescope on a mountain in Hawaii. And Tyson was going on to say that uh, usually they, these giant telescopes have specific projects and missions in mind, however, it's really important every once in a while for them to be pointed in a random direction in the night sky just to see what they might discover. Um, and I really took this to heart in our creative practices. We need to leave enough room um, to explore those little curiosities in life. And it doesn't have to be a lot of time. I'm sure you've heard um, different tactics like doing something with your non-dominant hand or driving a different way to work. Maybe it's using a different spice. Maybe it's taking that trip that might change the course of your career or your life. Um, it's, yeah, it's really about uh, uh, following those curiosities and exploring them just a little bit further um, to get out of your comfort zone a little bit. Um, on that, so on that note, I think uh, David Bowie said it best. Mm -hmm. Always go a little further into the water than, you're capable, than you feel you're capable of being in. Go a little bit out of your depth, and when you don't feel that your feet are quite touching the bottom, you're just about in the right place to do something exciting. So now I'd like to open it up to questions and discussions if you'd like to stick around. Um, thank you for listening to a little bit about my story. I hope it helped you. Thank you. Um, thanks, Chelsea. I have a question about timing. Um, so it looks like you're able to do some sketching or painting while you're on the river. Mm -hmm. Thank you for asking that because I realized as I was talking, I'm like, oh, I totally glazed over that part and I meant to address that. So um, yeah, it's it's very variable how much time off time I get on the river because um, we might be able to stop for five minutes or 20 minutes or have very variable times uh, downtime in camp. Um, so like I said, I usually keep a sketchbook close by and sometimes it is, is a matter of just picking it up and sketching what's right in front of me, just starting. Um, other times, I, I do. I walk away from whatever's going on in camp. It might be taking a small hike. Um, if I'm trying to create more of a composition, for example, um, I'm really like kind of looking for the really right place to sit that won't like be really uncomfortable for a long time. Um, in addition, because we're running the same river over and over, and over again, week to week, I um, get the chance to sketch the same things. So, for example, this little picture here um, is above Dagger Falls. I've drawn that view maybe three different times. I drew the outline one summer, and then the next summer I came back and colored in the outline. Um, so it was you know, taking those little bits of time and sometimes going back into them when I'm back in that spot again. How did you develop your drawing and painting uh, style? Um, it is kind of a lot of different things. I think a lot of it's influenced by uh, graphic design work. You can see a lot of what I do is pretty like solid lines graphics. Um, when I was a lot younger, I would just simply try to um, copy different styles of artists that I liked, and then that eventually kind of formed into my own style of artwork. Um, and working in a lot of different media because that kind of pushes it in different ways. In my bigger paintings now, I work largely in acrylic because I like the bright colors and that you can work really fast because it dries rather quickly. Um, when I'm sketching or on the river, I like to use watercolor because it's really fast. So those two things, because I get in different modes when I'm working on them, then it kind of influences the style a lot too. What challenge you pointed out was that it's hard to maintain that contact with your clients mm -hmm. in those few months that you're in the river. Can you expand on how you've been successful with that? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so a lot of my clients luckily are in the outdoor industry, so they think it's cool that that's what I do and I have actually been largely receptive to it. Um, of course, like I definitely lose momentum up over the summer. Like, like I said, I might get a few hours a week where I can answer emails and whatnot. Um, so it's really about setting up expectations and 
communicating that, hey, I'm going to be gone for a long time. And most people now, and since I've continually done this, when I get a new client, I say, okay, great, um, I'm usually gone for three or four months in the summertime. Um, but so much of what I do is project-based. So it's like, okay, great, we can get that done before you take off, or we'll pick it up again in the fall. Um, for example, one of the clients I work for now is um, Aret Skis, uh, doing one-off graphics for them. So we're really busy right now, but they had no work for me in the summertime. Um, so yeah, it's about managing those expectations of when I'm going to be around and available and setting up those time frames well in advance so that we can uh, yeah, complete projects and I'm not... I, so the first year I was working out there, I did try to keep up some client work and it was, it was kind of impossible, it was kind of a disaster. So I've kind of learned to phase that out over the years as I'm getting into May. I'm like, okay, I'm winding down on projects now. All right, well thanks so much, Kelsey.